Open the pod bay doors. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Miles per hour. I could wild away. 6, 56 degrees. Thank you all so much for being here. This is definitely an interesting topic and one that we hope will be um, generative and will you know, continue outside of this space. But to kick things off, of course, we'll have some questions from the audience, but we want to hear more from our panelists, if you don't mind. So first, just what got you interested in STEM? I mean, uh, for many young people, it's kind of scary. It seems kind of elitist. You know, Not everyone can do it. So what, what, what interests you? You know, when I was a young person, I always just really enjoyed math. Um, I don't believe that I was super good at it, but I loved that feeling when I got the problem right. And I'm sure so many of you may have felt that. Um, and then going through K-12 education, you know, uh, making it through calculus and those kinds of things, um, of course, it began to get a little bit more challenging, but I began to learn how to utilize my resources, and I started to reach out to other students mm. to find out, you know, how can we work together? And that wasn't like a practice that was sort of promoted by teachers. Um, and then going on to undergraduate um, and majoring actually in economics and minoring in mathematics, you still had those environments um, where you know it was challenging, but I just can't really explain the feeling for when you get a problem um, right. I still have my 32-page exam, which was a proof um, from my math class called uh, Beyond the Quadratic Equation, uh, because I worked really, really hard on that. And so I think. Internally, I wanted to be able to share that with future students, so I came up through the ranks. I decided to be a math teacher for many, many years in Seattle Public Schools in the state of Washington, and I wanted to show students the beauty of mathematics, but also the utility of mathematics, that it could be a very powerful tool to be able to read the world, to be able to help us solve really important problems, from planning your birthday party to you know calculating um, um, the uh, uh, launching and landing of you know space shuttles. So I think that's what really uh, made me want to get into STEM. And as I continue as a researcher at Vanderbilt, these are areas that I continue to study and think about. Awesome. So um, my story kind of <coughs> dates back to when I was just young. I always had a desire to look up. I love studying the weather, the clouds. Um, and just learning about the phases of the moon. Anytime there was a lunar eclipse or something or a comet going by, dragging my parents outside in the middle of the night, like, let's look at these meteorites. Um, but it wasn't until um, I was in middle school, I was about 12 years old, I got to go down to Kennedy Space Center and did a tour there. And while on the tour, we watched this movie, and it was a 3D movie, which was super cool at the time, in the mid-90s, yeah. <laughs> and um, they were uh, a crew on the space station, and they were running out of water, and there was a comet that was flying nearby, and so they sent a pilot, which was a woman, out to go and harvest the water off of that comet and bring it back to the space station. And I left the movie theater wide-eyed, like, oh, that is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> aren't we doing that now? And they're like, no, we're not. Um, in fact, that was pre-space station. Uh, Mir was up at the time, so it was a Russian space station, but the Americans had not even put up the first module yet for what's currently now the International Space Station. So I was like, well, why, why not? I mean, <laughs> clearly, um, this is easy. They did it in the movies. And um, what, what was told to me at the time was, well, if that's something that you're really interested in doing, then why don't you do it? And at the time, I was like, yeah, I could do it. Um, of course, I did not understand what that meant until later after I learned, well, you have to take calculus, you have to take trigonometry, you have to go into school for, for physics and engineering. And at the time, that sounded really daunting. But it was more my passion for wanting to be that person that got to put something in space or got to be that person in, in space that really inspired me to pursue the career that I'm on now. Yeah. Well, so both of you kind of knew from childhood that this was something that interests you. 
what do you think are some of the misconceptions that young people, uh, young women, specifically young, young women of color, that, that kind of steers them away from STEM? You know, what is that thing that, that scares them, that misconception that, se that makes young, young people say, I don't like math, I'm not interested in science, it's too hard? Yeah. I know for me, one thing that I was terrified of was the fact that I did not have a 4.0. I didn't have a 3.9. I didn't have a 3.8. <laughs> I <laughs> go down to like 3.0, I, yeah, I was rock solid at 3.0. And, and, um, but I, I was really passionate about extracurricular activities. I was on marching band, I did theater, I did singing and dancing in church. And so um, what I was afraid of was that because I wasn't that person that knew that could, I wasn't Catherine that could just convert um, from uh, entry, descent, and landing calculations into actual coordinates. That's a really hard calculation yeah. that she did on the board. Yeah, yeah. Every time I see it, I'm just like, oh my god. <laughs> I remember from orbital mechanics, that is not easy to do. Um, I, you know, it wasn't something that came naturally to me. So I thought, well, then, you know, I am, I'm not, I can't do that. But um, what I did know, and what um, you talked about briefly, was pulling your resources. So the, one of the great things about working at NASA is that you know it's not one person that launches the space shuttle, it's a team of thousands of people. And we have to pull on each other every day to actually um, be able to do what it is that we do. And so at a younger age, I had to learn how to work in teams and kind of pull on each other. Engineering school is hard, and, and a lot of your assignments, you have to work in groups in order to get your homework done. So that was, uh, that was something that, um, that I know I had to learn was working together. I think I answered your question. I kind of I ramble. I ramble a lot. Sorry. Yeah. You know the research suggests that girls are um, not as as advanced in mathematics, and we are seeing a lot of that sort of turn. Um, and what we value in many math classrooms, because I still see this today in 2017, is this child that whose hand goes up who's able to calculate it as quickly as possible, um, that has the right answer. What gets valued are those kinds of experiences. And women, and women of color in particular, have oftentimes uh, need some thinking time, need some time to actually think about the answer and to process. Um, and you guys have heard this, procedures versus like conceptual understanding. And depending upon who's in you know, the presidency, we go from like basic math and math facts to like, ooh, problem solving and, and all these different things. And I think that we need to focus more on a balance of having conceptual understanding. You guys saw in the movie, you know, mathematics and trying to figure out these problems, it's messy. It's not on the first try. Mm -hmm. And I think if we, as the math teachers that are in our um, classrooms today, would focus more on helping young women, really all students, but in particular helping young women understand that, um, you know, getting answers to problems doesn't always happen. And we can utilize mistakes misconceptions to actually deepen our mathematical understanding. And I think that's a problem that we're trying to work on, you know, as researchers, you know, we're trying to study this stuff and we're trying to do professional development with teachers, trying to help them understand that this is what's important. Otherwise, you know, you just, people have no problem going around saying, mm, I'm just not good at math. But you would never hear someone say, I'm not good at reading or I can't read. But they're very comfortable saying, I can't do math or, you know, I'm not good at math. And that needs to change because I believe that everyone is a math person. Everyone. Um, you just didn't have the right teacher. That's the problem. So. I think I'd agree. So my years as a middle school math teacher were sometimes torturous, just getting students to understand that they should be confident and they should try. And uh, just because you didn't do it my way doesn't mean you were wrong. If you found another way that was mathematically sound, go for it, bro, do it, try it. So um, I, I know one thing that we see in the school system is we don't have a lot of 
math, math people who become math teachers. We don't have a lot of people who are kind of ready to jump in and make sure that students have a, a very solid foundation in math so that they can thrive in science and in math and in other STEM courses in college. So um, I would just urge people out there, if you know someone that's interested, interested in education, try to push them towards some STEM courses. Uh, encourage them to be math and science teachers because we need them. But that was just my own selfish plug for our school <laughs> system. Um, now, before we go to these next two questions, do we have questions in the audience? Um, I want to give you all as much access to our panelists as possible before I just take over. We have one down here. Hi, I want to say thank you guys so much for coming. As um, a fellow engineer who doesn't practice engineering anymore, um, I, it's an honor why to you, be why, here. Why are you not practicing engineering? <laughs> I'm Art. a lawyer now. <laughs> <laughs> so why did you leave engineering? Oh, geez, this is like 20 questions. Um, She's trying to recruit you. <laughs> Um, I went into engineering to uh, differentiate myself for my law school act application. Um, I loved puzzles and math and science in high school, and engineering was actually my mom's idea, and my dad is a chemical engineer, so it made sense. So I'm a civil engineer from Johns Hopkins, so down the road uh, from Notre Dame. Um, anyway, but I have children who love math. I'm very, very fortunate on that. Um, but I wanted to kind of ask you advice um, on how to deal with children who um, have the, because I, I think that this happens when you're an engineer, that you want to be perfect and that you don't understand how to not be perfect. And um, how do you deal with that as a teacher, as and now I'm a parent, as a parent who has a child who wants to be perfect and needs to be perfect, um, how do we talk to children um, about making a mistake is okay? And then I also have another question, because I, now I do criminal defense work, so I'm kind of on the other side of the coin on my day-to-day -day job, and I see ch adults actually now that have gone through the school system and may have dropped out not believing in themselves, and how do we get past that? How do we have um, adults, especially in the minority communities, who, um, how do we fix the problem of not having uh, mentorship for them? Oh, that's a lot. Okay, um, no, it's okay. So I wanted to answer first just from a teacher's point of view, you have to be very patient, and that means um, allowing them to process and think critically, because I know I, I had to make a rule for myself. When they're working out a problem, I can't pick up the pencil at all. I don't care what I want to erase, what I want to show them, what I think will be easier if I point to it. I have to let them work, work through it and really coach them through. And um, one thing that you have to kind of train yourself to do is to see the good in their mistake so you can point that out to them. And uh, kind of you know asking them to talk through why they they guessed that thing or why they thought this might be the answer. And in that mistake, there is a lot of growth that can come from it. There is a there is some proficiency and some mastery of the content. Um, so yeah, just be very patient. Let them work through it, and remember that they have to have time to process it. I'm still trying to think how I'm going to answer. Um, kind of no, you go ahead. Let me, let me think a little bit more. Um, so mathematics is a human activity. And Can you use the mic? I'm oh, sorry. sorry. Mathematics is a human activity. And um, I think we need to help our children understand that. Get them outside of the textbook and, um, you know, whatever the teacher is giving them, if that's a worksheet or whatever that is out into the world. Part of what we need to do also is make math relevant so that kids, students can see math outside of textbook, that they understand that it's a, 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 um, a subject beyond what we do in school. That we do math when we are solving problems, you know, that we have, you know, in our own home. We're getting new carpet, or you know, we're getting our house remodeled, or you know, just real problems. Um, and the only other thing I think is just encouraging your son or daughter that 
um, real mathematicians mess up. That this is, these are skills and not just skills, but dispositions. You know, it takes messing up. It takes trying that problem, you know, 500 times. You know, Einstein flunked out of school. You know, no one believed in his work. Um, you know, and, and giving them lots of examples. So you can either be reading about that, um, you know, taking them outside of the school. I'm all about informal learning as well. So like doing stuff outside of the four walls of, of, of an institution. Um, and again, I think I would agree that it does take time because we're talking about hundreds of years, right, of a deep-seated practice of valuing rightness, correctness, accuracy, speed, right, in our class, in our math classrooms, exactly. So, you know, you're gonna have to have a little patience, you know, and just encourage him or her, you know, every day. And to, if, real quick, to piggyback on the real world use, one thing that we see in a lot of our math and science classes is, is that science and math professors in college are not very literate. Not meaning they can't read, but when they are working at equations, they're not explaining what these symbols mean, what this process is, why we, do, why would, why we are doing this calculation or using this theorem or this proof. So making sure that as you are explaining it to them, that you are having them uh, communicate it back to you, that the, you're having them verbalize and use math language, and that really ingrains and makes it more comfortable in them. So um, I, I would push anybody with math and science, just have them talk to you about it. Yeah, so um, for me, one big thing that I had, I was very fortunate to have when I was growing up, was my, my dad was an engineer. And so he was always eager to tell me about nuclear power. And I cannot care no less about <laughs> nuclear power. But one thing that just through constant telling me about it, taking me out to the plant, showing me everything was, um, I got to learn more about just his thought process. How do you think through a problem? And so that's probably the one thing that you could do to kind of help him kind of let go of the perfection part is start focusing on how do you actually think through how to solve a problem. Because unfortunately, when you get out into the workforce, the, your work is not given to you as a word problem. You're not given, you're, you're never given givens. You're never given right. what your variables are. <laughs> You don't actually really know what it is that your customer wants. My customer's Congress. It changes <laughs> all the time. Um, and, and, and so really coming to terms with how do you think through it? What can you take with the information that you have and try to get to a solution? And let go of the, the idea. That's probably the one thing to encourage your kids. Kind of, kind of let go of the idea that there's only one way to get there. And that's really hard to do, especially when you're young and all you're told is, if you don't get this answer right, you did it wrong. Show your work kind of thing. Um, it it took, a, took until I took um, my first quantum physics class. And they were like, well, you know, sometimes your observations actually impact your solution. I mean, you're like, well, what does that mean? It's, it's, if you look at, say, a photon, if you look at it one way, you see it as a wave. You look at it another way, you see it as a particle. So there's, it could be two things. What do you mean it could be two things? That doesn't make any sense. But you know, that's just <laughs> how the real world is. And um, repetition is probably the best way, just being told that over and over and over again. You kind of, that kind of helps build that, that sense of confidence. But I, I got to where I was, not only because of that, but because I was constantly being encouraged by my mentors, my professors. Um, and so it's an it's a interesting question or that you asked about how do we have more mentors in the, you know, of minority communities because, you know, I didn't have any African-American science or math teachers at all. Um, my mom was a nurse and, and so she knew the importance of mathematics, but once I started getting into calculus, she was like, I can't help you with your homework, I'm sorry. But, um, but I knew that she told me at least ask your teacher, always ask your teacher. And so I had to, at a younger age, just kind of get over the fact that they're not going to look like me, but they know how to get to the answer, so I need to talk to them anyway, right? So you kind of push them along um, there, but I don't know. That's why I do things like this, you know, because I didn't have someone that looked like me, 
So in my mind, I'm like, well, if I go out and try to do as much as I can in the community, unfortunately, there's just not that many of us, but we're getting there slowly, but we're getting there. I just want to add uh, two things. One, um, understand that mathematics is more than just arithmetic. So mathematics is geometry, spatial thinking, probability and statistics, um, problem solving. It's more than just like calculations. Um, and so that's the one thing that, that I was going to add. And then as far as this notion of mentors, it's one of the reasons why I study what I study. So I, I study underrepresentation of black women and girls in mathematics in particular. Um, and beyond that, I think about social justice. So how can we think about structures? So not just their experiences in um, you know, getting a bachelor's degree in mathematics or even going for a PhD. Um, you know, how do we um, think about and understand their experiences there, but then also how do we call out the structures? There was clearly racism, um, sexism going on in there, and my work is about intersectionality. So there's no real way to pull apart whether she couldn't go into that room because she was a woman or whether she couldn't go into that room because she was black. So that intersection is really important to think about. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how do we get more women of color to go into mathematics. Mathematics is what I love and live and breathe, and so I try not to think about STEM broadly, not that I don't care about STEM, but I really care about mathematics. So, you know, I'm always trying to think about that, and when we can get more women of color in the pipeline to get a PhD, then that means we're gonna get more faculty, right? perhaps that will teach in the math department. So then when it's time for recruiting and things like that, you know, if you're, if you're trying to recruit folks of color, you actually might have a professor that actually looks like you. Um, and so the problem is so extensive um, and there's lots of pieces that, you know, we kind of need to work on together um, as a society. This is not like a me problem or a you problem, it's an our. Um, problem and you know there are some great things happening around the country and, and things like that but we we have a long way to go still I see your hand sir I can bring you in the mic hi thanks for doing this <coughs> following that um, that comment is there a point at which we see you know, an age or a grade level at which we see women falling behind in these fields? And then is there a point at which we kind of see a, a point of no return where they can't, they can't catch up? Who are we talking about that, what's that window that we need to be in finding that encouragement point, especially, uh, obviously everyone, but is there a place where we can see where it's breaking down? So I would encourage you all, if you're interested in this, to look up the work of Jeannie Oakes, O-A-K-E-S. She's a scholar out of UCLA. She has done 30 years worth of work around tracking. Raise your hand if you've heard of that word, tracking. So essentially what happens in third grade, so to answer part of your question, it begins in third grade where you know, kids know, but teachers think they don't know when you have like the red jaybirds and the yellow canaries and the, do you know what I mean? So you have these three and generally what happens is when you get to middle school, those tracking systems become like locked and it's very, very difficult to get out of those tracking systems. So essentially, if you are not in eighth grade algebra, then there is no way that you're going to make it to Algebra 2, for example, to be able to then take the ACT and have any chance of passing that test because the ACT has publicly put on their website, we test the content in Algebra 2. So Jeannie Oaks has done this research that says that many black and brown children end up in lower tracked math classes, right? So it's very difficult for them to be able to reach the course that they need then to be able to, you know, apply for college and, and, and the rest of the trajectory, you know. Um, so it's not a matter of ability. It, it's, it's not, it's in none of that. It is like structures that are a part of our school system that we need to really, really address um, in addition to like teaching and learning math in, in more powerful ways, ways that, you know, we get more at conceptual understanding. But um, that's in part the answer. Third grade. 
<laughs> and to explain what tracking is, um, when you come in in fifth grade, everybody takes the same math. When you come you know, to sixth grade, you take the same math. We're in Nashville, we've been taking TCAP for years. Those TCAP scores often would put students into three categories, higher performing, um, uh, mastery of the content, or you know, proficient, middle of the ground, and then underperforming. And depending on where you're put, those are the classes that your counselor signs you up for for seventh and eighth grade. So by eighth grade, it would be ideal that we had every student taking a high school math course, Algebra One, which is now integrated math. But for our sake, Algebra One. Uh, if you're taking Algebra One in eighth grade, that means that you will have taken all the other math courses that you need to, to score above a 21, or really, what, a 25 on the ACT, because you, will have, you would have taken Trig and then Algebra Two by your sophomore year, so when you take the ACT as a junior, you're, you've taken everything that you need, and you would score high. Well, those students that get tracked in the middle or in the bottom, they typically take a regular eighth grade math course and then start their four credit high school classes in ninth grade, then they're already behind. So that's how you end up with students that, you know, unfortunately get to their senior year and they're scoring a 15 on the ACT. They're scoring a 17 on the ACT. They can't get that basic 21 to get accepted to college, let alone um, to get scholarships, and unfortunately, uh, in, in our society, we're still kind of dealing with a lot of stereotypes, so making sure that you don't track a student just based on what you think they're capable of, and I think that's where a lot of young people, a lot of uh, traditionally poorer students or students of color, they get lower tracked. Yes, kids, so I know, at least at, at NASA Marshall down in, in Huntsville, there's a um, kind of a drive to get a lot more involved in the middle schools, uh, what we found is that, say, I was fortunate enough that I just so happened to luck out to go to Kennedy Space Center when I was 12. That middle school time frame is another key time when girls start to, you know, puberty's happening and you're not really sure if I should be in the math class because that's where all the boys are, if I should just keep going in this direction because that's where the girls are. And so um, it's just, you know, middle school is all about gender and everything. So trying to figure out how to encourage more girls to go in STEM in middle school is really a, a big drive to what um, NASA Marshall is fo focusing on in Huntsville. And what we're finding is that even if you just expose them more, encourage them more, um, have more um, like the first robotics competitions that we do that are open to elementary school, middle school, and, and um, getting those out and getting the word out and saying, hey, you can be, um, as a, a, just a, a female, you can be a part of the team, you can be the team captain of this. There's a lot of different opportunities. So as an agency, um, they have really heavily invested in trying to get uh, girls involved because if we can spark their interest then, then we can get them into the right math classes and the right science classes. Because for me, when I was in middle school, they put me in general math, even though I had um, aced through all the, the Maryland state class or state test my seventh grade year, they put me back in general math. So my mom went to the school and was just like, what are you doing? She's gonna work for NASA one day. <laughs> and so um, she fought hard. She fought hard and um, was able to get me into pre-algebra my eighth grade year. And there is a limited number of slots. And so um, I was the extra person. I was number 11 and there's normally only 10 students. But because I had a mother that really fought hard for me, I was able to get into that. That's barrier number one. You're 13, you don't know that's a barrier already. But what that did is that put me behind because in my mind, I thought I needed to graduate high school with a calculus. And in Maryland, you had to take um, algebra one, two, geometry, trigonometry, pre-calc, and then calc. Well, if I'm already, in, if I'm in pre-algebra, that means I have to double up one year. So going in high school, I already knew sophomore year, I was taking, pre, um, taking algebra two and geometry at the same time. And so I had to do it. And I did pretty well, very proud of myself that year. But um, I, that meant that I had to start really working hard. And if I wasn't really that confident in myself, and I also didn't have a mom that was lighting the fire under me at, at the same, same time, I probably couldn't have made it. So that's, that's kind of answers, at least you know, in the Maryland school system, you have to really get them in that middle school time frame And um, peaking interest, I don't know about you, but me as a teenager girl, was, that was tough. I wanted to be a cheerleader. At the same time, I wanted to be a nurse. I was going all over, but I still wanted to work for NASA, too. So, 
really keeping on them, keeping on them too. Oh my gosh, so many hands raised. <laughs> okay. Oh. Thanks. So um, thanks again for coming. Um, but one of the themes of the movie is the unequal playing field. So can you talk a little bit how personally and professionally you keep up motivation when you know that your playing field is unequal? Mm. And we'll probably take one more question after this. But yeah, go ahead. Thank you. I'll try to, to, answer, to answer this quickly. So Fortunately, I, I'm a civil servant. I work directly for the federal government. And so on the pay scale, all civil servants are on the same pay scale, regardless of gender um, position. You, you, you're on a grade and you get a step. And after a while, they kind of just automatically, you just kind of get little step promotions. But, um, but that, that kind of helps remove um, the, the bias of gender and um, bias of, of your background or whatever for, for paying. However, um, just because of just the nature of things, I have a couple of mentors that started working at NASA in the 90s, and there were still not a lot of women there. Um, and so what you really had to do is you had to be a bit more aggressive, and, and then that kind of, causes this thing called the imposter syndrome, where you feel like, uh, I'm, I really, I'm just waiting on somebody to tell me that I'm not supposed to be here, kind of thing. And, um, and because of that, that can kind of either, if you're not aggressive, if you didn't feel like you're being aggressive enough, but you're being too aggressive, you didn't really know where you're gonna actually kind of end up, that can kind of, um, that, that tends to be an extra kind of mental burden that you have on yourself, and you find, that a lot of women tend to not apply for those upper positions because they don't know if they're being too aggressive or not aggressive enough. And, and so you end up having a lot more men kind of just, because they're just like, oh, well, that's just my job. That's just what I'm doing. And while we're having this internal struggle of what we're supposed to be doing. Um, but that's uh, kind of what I can benefit from now is that I have a lot more people that are very encouraging, regardless of, of color. They see, hey, you have potential, let's go and do this. I think you should go into this training program. So I really have benefited from the fact that, at least at NASA, they have really uh, focused in on diversity and inclusion. And the two go hand in hand. You can't just have diversity, mm -hmm. because then they won't let you in the door. You have to have diversity and inclusion. And so because of that, um, that push over the past 10 years, there's a lot more push for everyone being included, regardless of if you've been here for 30 years or if you've only been here for three kind of thing. So that's, that's kind of a, a good, good help in that area. I think I'll just add and just say, I just decided a long time ago, not really a long time ago, but maybe about 10 years ago, that I'm just gonna do the work that I know that I can do, and I'm not going to ask anyone. And so I'm going to try to do the best research that I can to be able to you know, have credibility and have people listen to me, and I don't even worry about the uneven playing field. For me, you asked for me about my own personal thing. These are things that I talk to my mentees about, my students, my graduate students, or you know, my own daughter, um, you know, and folks in my family. But um, you have to get to that point that you know you just know that you know what you know and take a risk. And um, you know, I started just thinking like a man. You know, I'm just I can do this, and I don't need anybody's permission. In education, we call that stereotype threat. Um, this idea that once you get somewhere, the stereotype that you think other people are placing on you, you start to internalize. So my, my freshman year uh, in undergrad, I went to the JPL, the Jet Propulsion Lab, that branch of NASA in California, and you know was waking up early in the morning, looking at stars, studying these binary systems. It was just so cool. And you know at night when they would do the debriefings, I was getting coffee or you know, kind of double checking someone else's computations, but I wasn't really there kind of soaking in the knowledge that I needed to, and I, I really internalized that. So I think 
um, as, as both of you have said, just kind of making sure that you don't internalize it, even acknowledge that it's there, but try to get some allies around you because you do need a support system. Um, you do need to be able to vent sometimes and you know call people stupid behind their backs. But um, just the idea that okay, we know that it's there, but we have to fight through it because there are some little people coming behind us that you know are going to need to stand on our shoulders. So uh, just, yeah, I think that would be what I'd say. Question this woman in the hat. So this will be our last question, if that's okay with y'all. I know it's very late. Hi. Um, so I grew up in Texas, and um, my junior year in high school, my physics teacher was a retired chief physicist from NASA. She um, she retired at like 65, and she decided she was going to become a high school teacher because. She had a lot of people coming into NASA who were really smart, but they couldn't critically think for themselves. They were just so used to getting right answers and yeah, kind of kind of being a calculator, but but not being messy, kind of like what you were saying. And so her whole thing was she wanted to come into a high school and teach kids, whether they were gonna go into physics or math or not, um, to think critically and think for themselves and um, use application and not just know how to solve a word problem. And um, so my question for you is, do you think standardized testing in the school systems has really, <laughs> has really done a disservice to, yeah, sorry, has really done a disservice to kids um, in on this, in this idea of thinking critically and using application and things like that because it was something that she talked about and she vented about a lot and I was just curious what you thought. I'll, I'll let them, I'll, I'll give my, I, man. Because uh, standardized has, I, what I have learned is I am not the best test taker. That's what standardized testing taught me. <laughs> it takes me a, a, a while to read a problem. I'm a, a person, like I have to read it over and over and over again. Like that, I don't have, an, there's not enough time to do that. Um, and so, you know, standardized testing was more for me, the way I had to approach it was, you know, try to, try to understand as best as I can and then just guess the best, which is not how you're supposed to do those tests. Um, but really, for me, it really, when I, I look at my career, in some ways I look at it like, I, standardized testing didn't really get me here. It didn't, um, really what got me here was um, when I was in physics class and my professor would draw, um, he loved horses, so he would draw these elaborate problems with involving horses and he would, while he's drawing it, he is kind of walking us through and making us visualize and conceptualize the problem and how your approach is. So really what it was for me, that kind of opened up my, my mind of, oh wow, there's different ways that you can get to different problems. And it actually is, even to this day, it still takes, it, I feel like I'm not doing that great if I don't come up with, a, with an answer fast enough kind of thing which isn't the case, which it should never really be the case. If it takes you an extra five minutes just to answer a question, that's okay. But at the same time, uh, the standardized testing does at least make sure that everyone has kind of like a equal education. I don't know, I, these ladies, are, this is not my <laughs> area. I'm trying to let them think, but um, I know for, for Maryland public schools, you know, we took a standardized test, third grade, fifth grade, eighth grade, um, junior year, senior year. We did something in seventh grade that was weird. <laughs> but, you know, I don't remember most of what was on those tests at all, but. Well, I'll say from both a teacher and now a school board member standpoint, um, I, I don't know that it's so much the standardized test, but the emphasis on the standardized mm -hmm. test that is yeah. kind of ruining us. Because in my mind as a teacher, every test was, was supposed to inform my instruction. So whether it was a three, three question quiz, whether it was just my quick assessment of the hands in the air that got the answer right, um, that informs my instruction, that lets me know what they've mastered and what, they've, what they haven't. So I think standardizing those tests and giving that feedback to teachers, it would be the best use of it. And that's something that we are just, 
I don't know why it's such an uphill, well, we do know why, because there's a lot of money in standardized testing, but if we could get more people to rally behind us to understand just how detrimental it is to kids that, you know, we're emphasizing this number, we're, you know, reducing our children to data points, it, it could be so beautiful, it could be so much better, it really could, um, you know, be testing that allows critical thinking and that gives feedback to kids without it being negative, but also gives, you know, uh, effective feedback to teachers. It, it could be so simple, but, yeah. So to answer your question, uh, yes, it has ruined us. <laughs> Yeah, that's the short answer. It has ruined us. And not to say, because I'm all about standards, like we need to have, you know, standards. Um, but that's just a fight that I have personally as a, as a researcher that I just don't even take that on because so long as, you know, we are breathing, there are going to be standardized assessments. They will never get rid of them. Um, and um, yeah, the bottom line is that it just, teachers are in classrooms now taking the last, what, four weeks before the, before the TCAP, talking about, ooh, it's test, you know, we're prepping for the test, and so they're teaching kids, you know, how to take the test, rather than what your physics teacher was trying to promote, which is critical thinking, processes, conceptualizing, uh, visualizing, because that's what the real world, real world is going to actually look like. Okay, that's great. I want to say thank you so much to Tiffany, Russell Lockett, and Nicole Joseph and Christian Bugs. Thank you so much for being with us.